A very good evening to one and all present here. I heartily welcome you all to an insightful session hosted by Asian Law College, Asian Education Group. Today, we all have gathered here to take insights on a very relevant and insightful topic, labor laws in India. To share his indispensable experience and knowledge on the same, we have amongst us an expert, Dr. Shrikant Malikaukar, advocate and consultant, Malikaukar and Associates. Sir is a specialist in labor laws and industrial relations and is practicing advocate at Pune Labor Industrial Courts and also at the Bombay High Court for the past 22 years now. He runs his consultancy by the name Maligaukar and Associates, which engages in litigations, consultations, and trainings in all dimensions of labor laws. He's associated with numerous renowned public, private, and government undertakings as their advocate and labor management consultant. He stood first class first in the University of Pune. He later turned to law, where he again stood first class first at LLB in the University of Pune. He simultaneously pursued management while studying law and has an MBA in human relations to his credit. He proceeded to England, where he delivered lectures at the London School of Economics, London, the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, and at the People's Institute, Israel, besides pursuing academics at the Bullitt School of Languages, Oxford Circus, London. He completed his master's degree in law with flying colors and then started his practice at the bar. He's a recipient of the prestigious Sivalent Prize from the Bar Council of Maharashtra, Bombay. He successfully led an Indian delegation to Shanghai and Beijing to study the comparative law, labor law situation between India and China. He's a visiting faculty in labor and industrial laws at the ILS Law College, Pune, for the past several years now. He's a visiting faculty in labor and industrial laws at the ILS College Pune. He has authored books and produced TV serials on labor laws. Sir has recently been awarded with the prestigious Samaj Shri Award by the Indian Council of Management Executives, Bombay, which was conferred on to him at the auspicious hands of the Honorable Minister for Culture, Maharashtra Strait. His consultancy imparts training in labor laws. He has conducted more than 1,500 training programs for esteemed companies like Mercedes, Volkswagen, Telco, Fiat, Palaji, Hyundai, etc. Without taking any further time, I would first like to welcome you, sir, to Asian Law College and would like to pass on this platform to you and request you to please share your insights on the topic with us students. Um, thank you, Garima, for that uh, wonderful introduction of mine. I hope you have, uh, frankly speaking, I think you have used more adjectives than what I deserve. Anyway, my friends, uh, we start with our uh, program right now. Say for the first 10 minutes, I will just enlighten you as to what is labor law, importance of labor law in India. And then, of course, I'm told that I'm going to uh, face a volume of questions, especially by students. And when it, there are questions by students, well, one has to think doubly and triply also and uh, before I answer them. Now, friends, uh, coming up to labor laws. Labor laws today is an all-providing subject in the sense, say in India, we have a booming population of, say, 136 crores. And uh, this 136 crores of people, they are divided basically into two or three types. One is a segment that is zero to 18 years of age. age. And as, a law, as everybody is a law student here, we are aware that we have an Indian Majority Act. After 18, a person is an adult. Below 18, he is not an adult. And child labor in India is prohibited. So whoever is above the age of 18 till the year the age of 60. Why 60? Because everybody retires at 60. So 18 to 60, if you are an employee, labor laws apply to you. If you are an employer, labor laws would continue applying to you till you die. I mean, it's as simple as that. 
Moreover, India and Pakistan, if you see, India became independent on 15th of August 1947 and Pakistan on 14th of August 1947. But if you see the comparison between two countries, India has been a land of entrepreneurs. And then the way we have excelled, if you see the reserve ratio between India and Pakistan, it's not even comparable. It simply means that we are much, much richer than our neighbor, that is Pakistan, and all the credit goes to two, three things. First is on the eve of the Indian independence, we had uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the first prime minister of independent India. Now you see, Jawaharlal Nehru had stayed in England, graduated in Europe, and had, a, had, had an aristocratic bent of mind. On the eve of Indian independence, there was a dichotomy in a school of thought between Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said that India stays in cottages and in villages, so let's go back to the villages. Nehru family, or Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Nehru family in the sense I am referring to Motilal Nehru, his father, and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, later Indira Gandhi. But then they had an aristocratic bent of mind and Pandit Nehru was of an opinion that if India wants to progress, it can only do so by industrialization. And uh, in 1947, there were no more industries. India had just become independent. We had partition and so many of the problems besides illiteracy and this and that. However, with the vision of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the first prime minister of independent India, and also the first chairman of the Planning Commission of India. You are all aware that the Prime Minister is the ex-officio chairman of the Planning Commission of India. And the vision of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was seen in the first five-year plans. We had many public sector undertakings such as Bakra Nangal and then Damodar Valley Corporation and Nagar Jun Sagar and Bharat Heavy Electric and Steel Authority of India, this and that and so many of the industries. There was a mushrooming of industries. And they were, these are large industries, then came smaller industries, small scale, medium scale. Slowly and slowly, India was knit into a matrix of so many industries. And once there were industries, there ought to be some laws also to govern the situation. And if there were no laws, laws have to be invented. So this was exactly done on the eve of the Indian independence in 1947, when we had the first law which was enacted, that was the Industrial Disputes Act 1947. I'm aware that I'm here to answer your questions and the time with us is limited because labor law itself is an ocean. I'm not going to take you through each and every section, but just to emphasize upon you the importance of labor laws. First and foremost, it applies to 80% of the population in India. And then you see so many of the industries which are growing here and there, even today, tomorrow there is going to be 5G and things are going to be simplified Technology is going to increase, industries are going to grow, and then we have foreign visitors also. In uh, I'm speaking from a city called Pune, and in Pune we have Chinese industries and German industries and US industries and American and UK, and you just name it, and all the industries are here. Slowly and slowly, this uh, wave is going to be in all corners and nook and corners of India, and then we'll have so many of the industries. Uh, Employment also may be generated. Some of you all might uh, become entrepreneurs also, big entrepreneurs also. But uh, uh, all said and done, what is going to prevail is labor law because whether you are an employee, whether you are an employer, whether you are employed in a university or in a college or even a school or in a private industry or in government or you anywhere, you cannot do without labor laws. So labor laws are applicable to whoever is an employee in India and whoever has employed somebody in India. So it's an employer-employee relationship. Wherever you see an employer-employee relationship in India, it goes without saying that labor laws are already applicable. So this is something about labor laws. And as I told you, labor law itself is an ocean. There are so many laws Say something to do with wages, that is the Payment of Wages Act 1936, something to do with the rules of an industry, which are enshrined in the legislation called as the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946, something to do with the backbone of the industry, that is the Industrial Disputes Act 1947, so on and so forth. Contract labor, the Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act 1970, then you are having the Unfair Labor Practices Act. Likewise, but uh, friends, I mean, 
needless to tell you that india cannot do without proper functioning and potent labor laws on the one hand we also have the unions union and managements the tug of war is not recent it is age old say somewhere in the 17th century 1778 we had uh, the first phrase which was used is the shop was struck and then the, we have i mean the word got metamorphosed and today we have strike as a very dreaded word in industry word in industrial circles it sounds like a blacksmith's hammer or the woodman's axe or the patriot's sword and then yes there is a strike in the undertaking and everything comes to a stand still so i mean all you have heard all of these things maybe in movies maybe on the television and maybe here and there you have seen there could be a strike there could be a ruckus in an industry and then the workers say this is a fight between haves and have nots say for example on the one hand is a rich entrepreneur or a rich businessman having 80000 crores of rupees in his pocket and on one on the one hand you are having a poor worker who just earns 8000 rupees per month which is going to get over by the end of the month and then this worker is dismissed by the employer and he says he is on the road what he does, he does not have money to eat two square meals per day now what is he going to do so government understood this on the eve of the indian independence itself the labor laws are framed in such a manner that 80% of the by 80 it's almost 90 95% of the labor laws are in favor of the labor just to break the monotony of what i am talking if you see post independent laws just to give you an example say husband versus wife laws 90 5% of the husband versus wife laws are in the favor of the wife the weaker section has to be protected landlord versus tenant laws 95% of the of the laws are in favor of the tenant on the other hand is a landlord the name itself contains lord such a big person and on the other hand is a poor tenant so the tenancy laws are in favor of the tenant management versus labor i just told you 80000 crores versus 8000 8000 rupees and then uh, this is a tussle or a fight between haves and have nots though i am aware of what i am saying there are notorious labor in india also and then there are notorious tenants in india also and in a husband and wife there are notorious wives also in india but the law does not function this way okay but this was just something a very general sort of a description regarding the importance of labor law which i hope i have um, just told you um, i'm told that you have so many questions and it would be more than my delight to answer all our questions so with my brief introduction i stop here and then we'll i'll answer you everything with the, in your questions because uh, there are many questions and the time with us is limited friends okay yes uh, so madam uh, coming back to you uh, this is something also as a brief of labor law which i just mentioned it to the students and i would be more than happy to answer the questions now yes madam indeed thank you so much sir i think this little talk of yours has uh, created a strong base for our students and at least these concepts are clear rest they've also shared their questions with us uh, so we'll start with the q and a what is the scope of litigation in the labor laws yes uh, now you see it's a wonderful question what is the scope of litigation when i when i started my practice or why i started when i started my practice even today law students many a times are misguided because it so happened that since british days we have only two courts civil courts and criminal court that's it then came up layers and layers of appeal there is a high court and ultimately the supreme court but then when a, for a newcomer i myself i am a first generation lawyer there was no lawyer in my family earlier and this is something very misleading that labor and lawyer half of the students think that it is something for the labor students fail to understand on the other hand is a management also and the management that's what i was saying that it's a tussle between haves and have nots and the managements I mean, they are rich people. All managements. I told you an example: eighty thousand crores of rupees versus eight thousand rupees. But then it is not only for the labor. And what is the scope of litigation? Labor law, a total cross section. I give you a simple example. Today is a time. Say, there are so many companies: Mercedes and Hire and Philips and whatnot. You mentioned. I represent them. 
here you see at the industry industry level we have a legislation called as an industry in uh, industrial employment standing orders act means what we all have been students once upon a time i was in a college you were in a college students are in college so there is a roll number everybody has there is a division everybody has there is an i card everybody has some rules are applicable can there be a college where no rules are applicable so when these two when i mean whoever is in the walk of life they join industry some rules will be applicable these rules in simple words are called as standing order now under the standing orders there are so many misconduct we came late that is a misconduct coming late on duty is a misconduct habitual absence is a misconduct act subversive of discipline is a misconduct writer's behavior is a misconduct theft at a workplace is a misconduct 26 misconducts are there the latest being sexual harassment of women at workplace now if somebody commits a misconduct it's not enough to say that you have committed a misconduct there must be a proving of the same and here the litigation start there is a inquiry to be held which is called as a departmental inquiry which is to be held in consonance and in accordance with the principles of natural justice there are so many law students i know who or there is a breed of people who are just inquiry officers one after the other inquiry they complete because the supreme court mandate on the same is very clear that you cannot terminate employees without holding a departmental inquiry in accordance with the principles of natural justice so at the industry level misconduct is committed again there is an inquiry inquiry means it is to be held by an impartial person only there are so many law, law students and lawyers who just conduct inquiries so that is one way of earning a living on labor laws second is a labor office you see labor is a compliance office you want a license for contract labor and for payment of wages and then for say everything you require a license a factory license and then there is a lot of compliance involved rather if you see these big companies there are officers who are called as compliance officers only they are big managers drawing hefty sums and they are paid very heavily that is another way third is becoming a lawyer as i am and i can practice i say in the labor court in the industrial court in the high court in the supreme court anywhere this the area of practice and all our law students so i need not more elaborate upon law practice they can practice then is some people some students of law my students they have preferred to be union leaders has anybody thought that these galaxy of leaders which we had in the past all trade union leaders say for example mahatma gandhi was a trade union leader or venkatraman president of india was a trade union leader manvendra nath roy george fernandez so many of them i mean these people have passed away now who is going to hold the reins as far as trade unionism in india is concerned so these are the students some of my students have turned up and they are doing good work and serving the society by being good trade union leaders also the worker somebody has to stand for the workers also and as far as lawyering is concerned there are two types of lawyers one who appear on behalf of the unions or the workers second is those who appear on behalf of management then you are having arbitrations also of course it's a debatable subject whether industrial disputes act contains provisions as far as arbitration and whether the industrial disputes are arbitrable itself that's a different story but then all of such things everything wage negotiations students can so the scope of litigation is too huge and this is what i am speaking with one industry in any town maybe in delhi or pune or bombay is there only one industry no there are so many so you can multiply this by industries and then the answer i will tell you whoever has entered into this the serena of labor or industrial law for your information after first is he is a law student then he end, enters here and after 3 years these people tell me my students when i call them he says sir i am busy i don't have time and that is the reality also they have become so so busy and i am very happy for them that yes 3 years back he was sitting on a bench like as students are in our college and now he has become so busy and he is i mean of course a respected gentleman serving the society serving himself also his family also and of course ultimately it squares down to money i will i mean what's the it's not only the service factor we stay in a materialistic world i mean let me answer you labor law is a branch of law where there is huge money also 
those of you all who want to understand the scope of the real litigation yes it's not simple money it's huge money let me tell you okay next yes madam i think students would have got their answer and most of them would have become more interested in this subject uh, sir can you please share your first court experience and what has been the most remarkable and difficult case of your career till now yeah the, i told as i told you i am a first generation lawyer i don't want to discourage students by giving them wrong examples but then the truth must be spoken my total junior ship was one month and 12 days including sundays holidays and bunking and uh, i mean in those days i still uh, remember i decided to be a lawyer as i told you i am a first generation lawyer and uh, the, that was a time i mean so many nightmares that if you start practice what will happen who would come to you who is going to be your client and all of these factors let me tell you these are all haunting factors even for half of your class who is sitting in front of me right now especially those who are first generation lawyers and there is a message for all of them see what makes a person a successful lawyer or i mean you want to excel become successful first and foremost is pandit nehru used to say no risk no gain so you have to take a risk also it's i mean all other factors your brilliance your intelligence your hard work your sincerity the your say punctuality and all of those personality factors no doubt are important i will not undermine them what is most important for lawyer for a lawyer is courage itself the courage to be a lawyer i mean we if i if you see in courts you will find half of the lawyers who are not well educated half of them maybe sometimes are at in even reading something forget arguing and if this is the situation then uh, i mean how come they are successful the success lies not in their brilliance the success lies in their courage i will not undermine brilliance uh, or hard work or whatever i will again say and in those days i still remember that there was something i read what uh, kapilya or chanakya wrote kapilya wrote a book called arthashastra and i read up a story that somebody came to kapilya and he asked him that sir i want to become rich and you are such a big arthashastri so let me have a formula yeah, i am sure you must be having a formula which teaches people how to be rich chanakya smiled and said of course i have such a formula said please tell us is it too long he said no 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 it's a very short one it's only three words chanakya said sahase lakshmi varsati where there is sahas either sahas hai udar lakshmi hai this is what students have to believe sahas is what you have the ability to take a risk see yeah, personally speaking i am no member of any provident fund i am not a member of any employee state insurance wherein i can be secured my life is not secured in that way nobody is going to pay me gratuity nobody is going to pay me a monthly salary and who pays me my clients pay me but then then this is the it's a game of adventure and when is this adventure it's right in the first instance as you get set slowly and slowly you crystallize into the subject and then as i told you after 3 years my students tell me that they don't have time that is what and india is having a burgeoning population i mean we people curse the population 136 crores but you can think of it in a different dimension 136 crores is a big market big countries like america and this and that they are eyeing on the indian market why can't indian see the indian market so this is one thing and your question was that was i mean what is my first case and how it to first case was heart in the mouth experience i never knew cross examination i knew nothing I only a bit so less i had was that i had three gold medals to my credit and a degree from london and then just it i mean it made me a bit of a super serious person that yes i know so many things when i entered court of law and the thing was that when with these degrees and these medals i when i went first i thought is yes, people must be waiting for me where are you where were you we were waiting we wanted a lawyer like you and this was a big shock to me when i entered the courts of law and then nobody knew me nobody was ready to look at me nobody was ready to offer work to me and then i mean it took me no time to come from my ivory towers and i made my it was a big 
I would not say a crash as far as my plane was concerned, but certainly it brought me on the ground. Then what is to be done? So um, it started off this way, of course. I mean, how to be a successful lawyer? I, it's my forthcoming book would be soon in the uh, market. And the name of the book is You Too Can Be a Successful Lawyer. That is the name of my eighth book, which soon would be hit the stands. So, um, I mean, those of y'all who would be interested can see as to what makes, how to be a, a successful lawyer. And the name of the book itself is You Too Can Be a Successful Lawyer. I was talking about my first experience, heart into mouth. I never knew whether the witness cross-examined him or as a lawyer, I cross-examined him. And then slyly, I used to look at the judge as to what he should be thinking about me. And then, uh, I mean, I just, likewise, it went on and on and on. But as I told you, practice makes the master. The first experience, I made 100% mistakes. Second experience, I made 99% mistakes. Third, 98. Today, I will not say I don't make mistakes. Where is human? Everybody makes mistakes. Today also, I make mistakes. But if you just brood upon the mistakes, then you have to sit at home. See, a friend of mine uh, who, who had a small stint of experience in practice, in those days, he did inform me. He said, see, uh, first I used to get scared. Then I used to tell the judges, no, no. Then I'll file a written argument. I will not orally argue this. I mean, everybody goes through this process. My friend informed me that you see ships are safe in the harbor. That is not what ships are meant for. Ship has to go on the high seas. The sea is choppy, but you have to face that. This is the duty of a lawyer. And ultimately, as I told you, practice makes the master. Slowly and slowly, then there is a nerve building also. Today, if somebody tells me that there is a strike in such and such a company, I will say, okay, we'll talk about it later. I'm with a me in a meeting with somebody. On the first day of my practice, if somebody had told me that there is a strike in such and some company, I would have fallen unconscious on my chair. So that nerve building, your, I mean, ultimately in courts of law, you should have nerves of steel. So that is built slowly and slowly. Nothing to be panicky about it. Nobody is born um, with, uh, say, all of these skills. You learn it here only. But then who learns it? One is into practice. And that's why it's called practice. Nobody is perfect in law. Neither I, neither anybody, even if I practice a thousand years, I won't be perfect. It happens with everybody. A law students should understand. And my first, slowly, my first performance, I told you, it was a heart in the mouth experience. Nobody knew, I knew, I never knew what ha is happening somehow slyly. Um, in those days, I still remember, I went in, in the judge's chamber just to apologize how bad my performance was. The judge smiled at me. He said, sit down, a junior lawyer. The judge offered me a cup of tea. I still remember. And he said, do you know one thing? He said, I've come from a remotest village in Maharashtra, where people even don't know to talk. Your performance is at least 20 times better than what I was when I started practice, is what the judge told me. This boosted my courage. I don't know whether he was true to whatever he's saying or he was just motivating me but it really motivated me and it motivates me even today. And one should not be so self-critical also. What will people think of me and what will he think and I should be a perfectionist. No, perfectionism, perfectionism never exists on earth. Then some are lazy. Don't be lazy. Then some are only thinkers, great thinkers. I can think about this and what about this doctrine and what about doctrine of relation back and he can cite all the doctrines on earth. But when it comes to practice, I mean, he cannot deliver the goods. What's the use? He's just a thinker. You don't have want thinkers. You have to have be a doer also. Good thinkers and good doers. I mean, that's the combination. And slowly, my experiences went on, I would say, improvising. I started improvising. And one thing, I started comparing myself with myself only. That is the way one has to compare. You cannot compare with anybody. Somebody who is, I mean, people are different, knowledge is different, languages are different, uh, circumstances are different, so many things are different. I mean, I'm sure all our law students and in Article 14, you have already read that what will not be denied, the state will not deny equality before the law and equal protection of all laws. The equality is amongst equals. 
and in society amongst your friends also everybody is not equally placed people are from different circumstances so you have to beat up all the situation and then i mean i am sure there is not a single person in, in this class who does not have the potential to be successful let you take it from me i am a first generation lawyer everybody will be successful it's only it's a bit of a tough time initially there after everything is smooth let me tell you that okay yes madam well i think these are some lessons for life that we should not refrain ourselves from new experiences be it good or bad and that trains us a lot indeed very beautifully said sir how will the new codified labor laws impact the litigation of labor law litigation of labor law basically we are we are having too many cases in cold storage today supreme court p crores this one whatever four crores and the labor the same i mean they are they are making they are making refinements also but once upon a time when a worker was dismissed by the time his case was referred back to the labor court it took 10 to 12 months what he is already dismissed the prob his problem basic problem is what is he going to eat tomorrow and then you are taking 10 months for the case to refer it to the court then 3 years of hearing then 2 years of appeal what happens to him so there should be some refinements and these refinements the labor codes which i as i see them they have taken a cross section of the total industrial functioning from 1947 that is the day india became independent till today some taking some lessons from some landmark judgments likewise they have refined the labor laws and as far as the curtailment of time is concerned Uh, possibly there could be an admission stage i am not much aware because the rules uh, are not notified i mean there are no rules framed as such as uh, the, about labor codes labor code is a framework then we will be having separate rules every state might be having separate rules and then we are going to function as far as rules but taking lessons from all of this it has so happened that some sectors of the society are yet under a spell of injustice for example which has been cured in the labor codes for the first time in labor labor codes the manager is included in the definition of a workman till now say even today what happens is there are only two classes managers and workmen a workman is a person who is say, defined in section 2s of the industrial disputes act as law students everybody should be knowing some of you all those who are in the final year might have already studied labor laws who is a workman one who does manual skilled non skilled technical clerical operational and supervisory work the rest is managers managers say maybe some of your friends are managers just ask them there is no protection zero protection for managers whatsoever in this country so i call a manager i make him sit down and i say enough of it i don't need your services and this is your whatever full and final settlement and please go home and he just has to go home he cannot go in any court the manager i mean of course the doors of the civil court are open but then it's going to take donkey's years for him if at all he files up a case so when will be hearing be and all of those so these things have i mean all managers have been desisted from the idea of going to the court itself in labor codes for the first time manager is included in the definition of a workman this is number 1 and second is there are separate courts for managers also so this would be something in addition then there are different types of workers in india the thing is i join at the age of 18 whether i am efficient inefficient this that anything I, the worker the employer is supposed to carry my economic dead weight till the age of 60 moreover it doesn't give me a leeway to do something else so the government thought over it and they have uh, i mean some foreign examples and some foreign lessons also we have taken in the sense now there are some new categories of workers platform workers are different big workers are different say i am a carpenter and i can sell my skill to your company say i am have put in 20 years of my life in carpentry so i am a skillful worker and i am going to sell you my skill for 5 years so I, that would be at a better price so i get a better price and you also get a good worker and this is only for 5 years so you need not be unhappy and then say be afraid about the total thing 
as to you are going to carry the economic dead weight of my employment till I retire. No, only five years, fixed term employment. This will come. So these are new refinements which uh, we are going to see. And of course, change is always a sign of progress. And it's time for a change. Otherwise, in 1947 also we had labor law. So let's go by that labor law only. No, as society progresses, technology progresses, today you are going to have 5G, everything is going to change. So we also have to change. And in fact, these codes were long awaited. And then, and we stay in a democracy. Some people might like some codes, some people might say, this is not right, this is wrong, this is this way. I mean, it's like selecting an Indian cricket team. Whatsoever team you select, it satisfies nobody. As there is, I mean, has the Indian cricket team satisfied all 136 crores of Indians in one go? Answer is a simple no. Some say, why should Virat Kohli be inside? And some said that, some say that, uh, why should this person be go out? And why should Ajinkya Rane be the captain? So many stories to that. It's all a game this way only in a democratic country. And I guess everybody does have a right to agree or to disagree. That's a different story. But then, I mean, this is a new era in which we might be entering. And what is the, whether we'll be successful or unsuccessful, I am always positive minded, thinking positive. Yes, why should we be unsuccessful? And plus it's a cross-cultural setup also. World is becoming closer. Technology is bringing us closer. closer. It's a global village. Today we are having the Japanese people coming here. We'll learn something from Japanese. We are having Chinese people, we learn work culture from Chinese. We are having Americans who come to Indians. We learn work smartness from Americans. I mean, there was a saying that it's okay that you are learning work smartness from Americans and um, good cultures and good discipline from Japanese. It should not happen that the Japanese learn the laziness of Indians. So, I mean, it should not be vice versa, but then it was just a joke. So, uh, I mean, things are this way. So we just have the labor codes which are recently introduced. Moreover, the notifications are yet to come and the rules are yet to be framed. Okay, yes, madam. So something uh, related to a very recent occurrence. Uh, recently, Virat Kohli went on a paternal leave. Do you think uh, there is any legal backing to the paternity leaves in India? Yeah, now what has happened is I am on the wage negotiation, negotiation committee of uh, most of the companies. We recently had um, wage agreements in Philips and Bridgestone and so many of the companies. Now you see, when it comes to leave, first and foremost, this factor of leave is governed by labor legislations. I'll not take you deeper into that. Coming directly to your question, paternity leave. Maternity leave, we are having the maternity benefit given to all women, whoever are pregnant, and then earlier it was 12 weeks of pregnancy leave. Now it is extended to 26 weeks. What about paternity leave? Basically what has happened in India is today is an age of nuclear families. Earlier joint families were there. One household had say 30 people living under the same roof. So 30 people is approximately say 15 women. And even if somebody is pregnant, delivers a child, there are seven women to look after her. In a nuclear family where the husband is also working and the wife is also a working woman. There are no parents, nobody to look after them. So who is going to look after the woman? I mean, the wife and the child. So unions have also started demanding that there must be a paternity leave. Today it is controlled because it constitutes a service condition. And this is included in a settlement which is made with the union and the settlement is registered under section 2P of Industrial Dispute Act 1947. Now, there are some new things which will be coming. And let, let me tell you something else, which has not yet entered India. Of course, a bill has been introduced in Parliament of India. In France, you have a right, which is called as a right to disconnect. You have appointed me as an employee. My appointment letter says that I will work for eight hours, a nine to five job. After five, the employer will not call me because that would offend my privacy. My employment with you, you have employed me only for eight hours. So why do you are, why are you calling me at eight o'clock? Eight o'clock is my family time. I see TV serials, I have dinner. You cannot call me at eight o'clock. Now a situation has come. France, this law is already passed. India, it's yet to come, but a bill is introduced in the parliament of India. There will be jammers from official mails. So there cannot be an official mail 
coming to me from my company after five o'clock. That is right to disconnect. It's not come in India. It's introduced as a bill in the Parliament of India. But if it's already in seven eight countries, surely it's going to come to India today or tomorrow. As you are having the Maternity Relief Act 1961 in the law books today, it's not out of place that by compulsion today it's by way of an agreement, but tomorrow by way of a compulsion, by way of a legislation, there is going to be a paternity leave, and some big companies. Now I represent Philips and so many of them. I mean, they do have paternity leave. Moreover, I mean, forget from this. I mean, don't look at it from this angle that there's a paternity leave and we want it. Look it from another angle. A new a couple in a nuclear family, only husband and wife. And if the wife is admitted in a maternity home, who is there to look after her except her husband? So. It's all in the fitness of things that a paternity leave should be there, which, as I told you, it's today under settlements. But tomorrow there could be a legislation also. And yes, again, that's a sign of progress. Yes, yes, ma'am. So the new labor codes propose the idea of a single tribunal for all the labor laws issues, and the courts are already overburdened with the work. Don't you think that this will increase the burden? No, thus, in fact, madam, the, it's not a single tribunal. It's a divisional bench they are thinking of creating. Okay. At some places it's single. At some places it's a divisional bench. There will be two members. One member would be a judicial member. Second member would be a administrative member. Administrative member in the sense the other judge would be, he is not from the judicial field. He has come up to the ladder of an of administration. And he is of the level of a joint secretary. So only he can be qualified to be a non-judicial member. So a divisional bench consisting of a judicial member and a non-judicial member will hear the cases and then deliver the verdict. As it happens in a divisional bench before any high court. So that would be a larger deliberation as far as every case is concerned. So the judicial member will look at it from the judicial point of view, that is the legal point of view. And the administrative member will look at it from several other points say as to administration affecting it is that of course both should both are expected to take decisions not only from the head but from the heart also so likewise so this is and at some places of course this could be curtailed or changed by way of notifications by way of say ordinances or whatever not if at all the government tomorrow feels that no that uh, we cannot have two judges at every place and in every district so they can change it also but uh, as the labor codes stand today, uh, what they reflect is that there could be two judges. Yeah. Yes, madam. So, so what is your view on the suspension of the labor laws in UP during the COVID time? Yeah, during the COVID time, there were a deluge of cases which sprang up. It was Nagarika Exports, okay. Ludhiana um, Tools Association. Then it was, there were so many cases which came up. Lockdown, nobody expected the lockdown. Not one fortune teller on earth did predict that there would be a lockdown. And then we had a lockdown. People started suffering. Migrant labor had different questions. And uh, in the meantime, there came up a news that 1,000 companies are leaving China. 1,000 companies leaving China. Japan has already, even today, today morning I was reading. So many of the company, uh, countries have refused to purchase even the Chinese vaccines. Mm. And it so happened that there was an exodus of these companies, or rather even then it's to, today, even today also, the exodus is continuing. Now 1,000 companies leaving China, I mean, it's mouth-watering for other countries. So they started keeping up the red carpets, and so was UP government. And UP government also laid the carpet, carpet we want industrialization to happen in UP. And there's nothing wrong in that. We invite all those companies to give them tax holidays, you to give them tax shelters, and this and that. And Madhya Pradesh also followed suit. And it was Rajasthan also. It was another, there was it was another follow. UP it so happened, and they say, well, I mean, how can you come? What about your labor laws? They are too stringent. So we'll relax the labor law. We'll give you this thing. We'll do that thing. What about the union? See, whatever labor laws you have today, Rome is not built in a day. These labor laws, people have fought for it like anything, right from the first 
ट्रेड यूनियन लीडर इन इंडिया हु इज राइटली कॉल्ड एज द फादर ऑफ द इंडियन ट्रेड यूनियन मूवमेंट नारायण मेघाजी लोखंडे स्टार्टेड इन एटीन एटी फाइव Since 1885, these workers have waged a relentless battle against unscrupulous employers, and then we had Mahatma Gandhi himself in Buckingham and Karnataka mill strike. Then you are, as I told you, Manvendra Nath Roy is there, N M Joshi is there, Sri Padam Bru Dange is there, V V Giriyar, Venkat Raman, George Fernandez. I mean, I can the list is too huge. They have all built up the labour laws, and with a stroke of a pen, in one day you say that I am eyeing on some companies who are coming. And for whatever are my sinister designs, or maybe I mean forget sinister, but it is my selfish motive. Selfish in the sense what? Yes, I want you to prosper, but I cannot be unmindful of the fact that uh, I'm, these labor laws, which are built by so many of the people, and which have guaranteed certain things, and it has granted a protection to our workers, cannot be taken away overnight. And that is why, of course. Uh, it so happened that somebody filed a parade petition before the Allahabad High Court, and the Allahabad High Court was to strike it as unconstitutional and this and that. In the meantime, the UP government would do that, whatever changes they were to make, and then the issue ended there and there itself. But of course, just to answer your question, that was a wrong move on the part of the UP government. Yes, madam. Right. So, what is the scope of arbitration and conciliation in the labor laws dispute? Arbitration and conciliation, we have to see two labor legislations. One, one is the labor legislation that is the Industrial Disputes Act, nineteen forty-seven. Second is the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, nineteen eighty-six. And there is a dichotomy in the school of thought. Basically, what has happened is we had, I believe, uh, Kingfisher Airlines case. And um, second is, uh, if I am subject to correct myself as far as the names are concerned, it is Ravish Malhotra or somebody. One is a judgment wherein in Kingfisher Airlines, the pilots had filed up a case against uh, already a dying Kingfisher airline or something, and then the Kingfisher Airlines put pointed out that in their appointment letter it is stated that in the event of a dispute, the dispute would be referred to. An arbitrator, and uh, the matter reached the Bombay High Court. Justice Sundar Baldota, I remember the judge's name because I had appeared in front of her, and uh, she uh, had a put uh, up a finding. You no, know, whatever are industrial disputes, they are not arbitrable, and then they struck it down because here the working class, as a class, the class interest is important. So whatever is an industrial dispute, industrial dispute is defined in Section 2K of the Industrial Disputes Act. Any dispute between workmen, workmen, employers, 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 workmen, with respect to employment, non-employment, terms of employment, and conditions of labour of any person, that is the definition. So this is not arbitrable only. It's the judgment. However, Karnataka High Court has held a Slightly different view. They said that the disputes are arbitrable, provided you recalibrate it within the four corners of the Industrial Disputes Act. Then only it's arbitrable. So the difference of opinion between these two courts is very marginal. But however, we it safely to conclude, we'll say that the industrial disputes are not arbitrable. So arbitration, I mean something. But tomorrow, this cannot be ruled out. Also, there is nothing wrong. Personally speaking, as I see, that if I am ever having a dispute with my employer and I am an employee, I will say I have a Tom, Dick, and Harry friend who is ready to solve it. So what's wrong? Why should I go only to the court and again burden the court and again you and me raise a you and cry that three uh, empty crores of cases are in cold storage again? I mean, are we not systematically increasing the burden? In foreign countries, there is private adjudication also. So long as this is okay, but as a lawyer, it's my duty, and you all are law students. It's my duty to enlighten you that as on today, they say industrial disputes are not arbitrable. Yes, ma'am. So, what are the best practices to be followed by employer and employee as per the Indian labour laws? Best practices is everybody employer should not be selfish. They should not be. Unscrupulous, and then they should be ethical, and this and that. In putting it very simple, say 
in state of maharashtra we are having a legislation which is called as the maharashtra employees of i'm sorry maharashtra recognition of trade unions and prevention of unfair labor practices act 1971 now this legislation has attained a momentum and it has become so popular that it has even pushed industrial disputes act on the back seat at some places barring collective disputes okay now the success of this act was so tremendous it's enacted in the year 1971 that the central government amended the central legislation that is the industrial disputes act 1947 all law students should be knowing that the industrial disputes act the central piece of legislation and the maharashtra name maharashtra itself it's a state act so what they did is that they added schedule 5 to the industrial disputes act schedule 5 of the industrial disputes act is equal to schedule 4 of the maharashtra act in making it very simple i'll make it very simple what i'm talking i'm aware that some students are right in the first year of law some in the last year making it very simple today all unfair labor practice all over india are the same now a good employer is an employer who does not indulge in unfair labor practice who does not victimize his workmen who does not exercise colorability in his actions what is colorability colorability springs up from a doctrine which is called as a doctrine of colorable legislation that which you cannot do directly you cannot do it indirectly also so he should not have find ways and means to terminate people then he should be holding a departmental inquiry in accordance with the principles of natural justice and it should not be in utter disregard also and he should not put up a concocted show of uh, implicating people in criminal charges likewise whatever are unfair labor practices an employer should desist from doing it which makes him a good employer and that is what he is to be now you see karl marx marx wrote the communist manifesto marx and friedrich engels and now karl marx also wrote another book that is the das kapital wherein he says that profit itself is a dirty word now profit itself is a dirty word in the sense what marx said that god made the mountains god made the flowers god made the trees god made the fruits who are you and me to derive profit out of it you cannot derive profit from something which is god made so profit itself is a dirty word this is communist ideology capitalists don't think it this way capitalists will say okay i am giving you an opportunity you are, i am also having an equal opportunity let us do business whoever makes the profit makes the profit it depends i mean how we pose ourselves on to cater to an ideology the question is that uh, uh, <clears throat> what we see is that this is okay so who should be a good employer rather if you ask in communist countries they say no employer is good how can an employer be good it's owned by all of us is a good employee good employee is a good worker that yes who is a good worker he is to be sincere and this one and that one and let me tell you something else over the years my experience do you know what sort of a worker employers like and this question was i, I had asked this question to some of my attendees who had attended my training programs and then somebody said that i want a servant who is loyal and somebody said i want he should be sincere somebody said that he should be hard working and somebody said that yes he should be punctual and this and that let me tell you and share a secret with you over my 30 years of practice i have concluded as to what type of people what type of employees employers like employers like only profitable employees so you are i mean you should be profitable to the organization maybe you are a bit whimsical but if at all you deliver the goods and then yes you can move mountains and you can do this thing and that thing certainly the employer is going to be in love with you he may not he might give you a raise i mean neglecting and turning a nelson side to whatever are your personal idiosyncrasies that's not the point employers only like profitable employees you take it from me so this is the way you can put who i just ask anybody who is an employee anywhere i mean there are so many so you, i mean of course it's not that the loyalty and sincerity goes out of place it certainly has an importance but what comes to the fore this is you has something to do with human nature I mean, what will i do with your loyalty and sincerity 
and would anybody like an employee employee who is not profitable but is just sincere comes in the morning works sincerely works hard is punctual but he cannot deliver the results and he is not at all profitable to the organization and somebody maybe he is a late here and there 15 minutes but he is very profitable employers always because i employer doesn't like the employee what the employer likes is pro are profits what he likes basically is the profit only so he is in tune with the profit so whoever makes profit makes life easy and comfortable for the employer and he is a rich person at the behest of the employer employee so he goes with him so this is the way it so good and a good employee and a good employer employer i can understand that say, whatever are the rights of the workers he is to cater to those rights not to be obnoxious not to be unscrupulous not to be snobbish all of those qualities and an employee employee from the employer's point of view is only a profitable employee okay yes madam well indeed a very practical and pragmatic answer sir uh if we uh, had time i'm sure our students uh, you know would love to chat with you and know more things from you but one last question you're looking at the positive time what one career advice would you like to offer to our students sir uh, can you repeat that one what career advice would you like to offer to our students yeah one career uh, advice career advice if i am there and i mean not many to offer but as the time is limited i'll tell you something when i was of the age of these college students there was an organization of which i later became the president and the name of the organization is pune in pune it was pune junior chamber mm -hmm. it's called jc is earlier i'm sure in delhi also this organization still exists mm -hmm. and uh, i was a member of that organization and in that organization we had a creed it's like a prayer mm -hmm. so whenever we assemble for every meeting we used to Uh, speak out the creed uh, or you can say you can sing the creed the chorus and uh, in that creed of course it's a long one but i just tell you something which really influenced my mind and what really made me become a lawyer and the last line of that creed was it went this way that economic justice can best be won by free man through free enterprise if you want to be free you, what Uh, becoming a lawyer it may give you money it may not give you money there is that but certainly it is going to give you reason to live and it is going to give you abundant freedom a lawyer enjoys the most freedom in than anybody else let me tell you that and uh, it again i mean i will repeat it for you economic justice can best be won by free man through free enterprises so if i want to be economically independent if i want to be rich and this and that and what not i everything want all good things happening to me then i should be free also and i will win economic justice for whom for myself by being free economic justice can best be won by free man through free enterprise i don't know who is the author but this line influenced me this line itself made me a lawyer this line influenced i mean further i mean the being a lawyer is one thing we also have an it company and this and that when i mean what makes me an entrepreneur there again it is this sentence that economic justice can best be won by free man through free enterprise so this is my i mean i don't know whether i am that elderly and that wise to give you some advice but then yes you can ponder and think it over that what it means and then if at all you um, freedom is not a product you get in any shop to enjoy the freedom and then uh, life itself itself is an adventure as well as an enjoyable experience it is what i can tell you from my um, humble practice whatever i have over these years so uh, this is i mean there are many more things of course um, my great book which i would be soon hit the stands that is you too can be a successful lawyer there are there are many more aspects to this and the time is too limited to sum it up and, uh, yes madam Well, thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> uh, firstly, uh, on the behalf of all the students, uh, is that that I'm sure you spoke about so many things, but in such a simplistic way, you explain them uh, so wisely and with so many examples that, be it a fresher or our you know senior students, they they've really understood the concepts well. 
and thank you so much sir once again on behalf of asian education group all the directors faculty members and our dear students uh, for uh, giving us your time sharing your expertise with us and i propose this vote of thanks we look forward to a continued association with you sir in future as well mm -hmm. to acknowledge your wonderful presence here amongst us we would like to present a memento thank you ben thanks for you i am honored to be uh, invited by your esteemed uh, school of law yes thank you so much sir indeed it was a very knowledgeable and insightful session and we look forward to such sessions in future as well with you thank you so much once thank again thank you thank you